let me let me preface this by saying that um this is not familiar territory for me um i decided a while ago that if i was ever going to work on this stuff i needed to just go out on a limb and write a paper without really understanding what i was saying uh, so that's what i did um and nick has already given me some really helpful thoughts about places that i misunderstood some things um, hopefully the presentation I give you today will uh, take that into account pretty fully but um, you know don't be surprised if I misunderstand some of the stuff I'm talking about because I am not trained in string theory in any you know kind of uh, thorough way um, but I thought it was you know, I, I think it's an exciting frontier that we're finally kind of looking at it in philosophy, and I think um, I wanted to do some metaphysics with it, which is what I like to do with whatever physics I'm thinking about. So in the case of string theory, it was kind of easy because um, people have made some comments, fairly offhand comments, but fairly provocative comments about um, uh, string theory involving a, a very sort of interesting metaphysical um, claim that there are extended simples or objects that are indivisible but have non-zero size in space. And I wanted to examine whether that was correct. Uh, and my opinion is that um, we don't now have much evidence from string theory to believe that there are extended simples. So, um, some people have been of the opinion that, that string theory, at least uh, sort of on the face of it, posits the existence of extended simples. So uh, these remarks are both, I should say, um, n none of this is people who have defended the view as, as the point of their paper, right? Uh, what we have in the literature so far are some sort of um, tangential remarks from people who are thinking about other things. Uh, so the first is, is from Craig Callender, who was writing a paper about the methodology of metaphysics and the philosophy of physics. Um, and Craig was um, sort of criticizing a priori uh, work on whether there are extended simples. Um, and sort of his position was, well, don't tell string theorists with your a priori metaphysics that what they're saying is nonsense. Um, it looks to me, Craig said, and like I said, it's just a, just a, a sort of uh, momentary remark. So I don't want to say this is something that he's kind of um, uh, holds as a strongly considered view. But he says, on its most natural interpretation, super string theory one of the more promising <coughs> attempts at a theory of quantum gravity posits extended simples. And it's clear that from, from the, uh, the surrounding passages that he's talking about the strings. Uh, and then in um, uh, the Elegant Universe, so this is a while back, but this is a passage that's been cited a couple of times by metaphysicians who are interested in extended simples. Uh, Chris McDaniel and um, uh, Josh... Um, Josh, I can't remember his last name actually, but uh, a couple couple of people have cited this passage. Um, Brian Green says um, strings are truly fundamental. Bit of an ambiguous uh, uh, phrase there, which we'll sort of talk about in a second. But he says less ambiguously, they're atoms, uncuttable constituents in the truest sense of the ancient Greeks. Chris, I should check and make sure that when I turn my head, am I am I cutting off all the voice to you guys when I do that? Can you hear me okay? Uh, yeah, I'll think a little bit. Oh, so so okay, so so it would be better if I if I were more careful about facing the mic. Uh, it's better for us. Yeah. Okay, good. All right, I'll 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 be much more careful about that. Thank you. Okay. Um. So, so Green goes on to say, right, that 
uh, strings are indivisible in the sense of composition and have no parts. Um, he says, even though they have spatial extent, the question of their composition is without any content. That sounds like he's speaking very literally in terms that a metaphys metaphysician would understand as about the idea of extended simples, right? They're indivisible objects that have size. Um, both of these claims are about strings themselves. Um, so I'll, I'll talk first about the, um, the claim that strings are extended simples. And that one, in my opinion, falls apart pretty quickly. Um, but uh, what's more interesting is the claim which David Braddon Mitchell and Christy Miller have um, defended that uh, string theory in the future is likely to involve um, uh, minimum size regions of space and that these are extended simples. So the first part of the talk will be I'll talk about this, I'll be talking about the strings themselves and the second part I'll talk about the question of whether parts of space in string theory could be extended simples. So what reasons do we have for thinking that strings are extended uh, objects with no parts? Well, what Green says, Green says, look, a string, in his, his term, this is a direct quote, is simply a string as there's nothing more fundamental. It can't be described as being composed of any other substance. So um, one thing to note here is that Green might be equivocating on the idea of fundamentality, right? There are ways of being fundamental that don't necessarily require something to be simple. Um, for example, you can have an object that's fundamental in the sense of um, uh, in the sense of there's no explanation, no deeper explanation for it in the sense of like what we might call like scientific or metaphysical explanation. There's no deeper explanation for it and it explains other things perhaps, uh, but still it might have parts. It's kind of a strange view in metaphysics these days, although parallels have been drawn between it and um, David Wallace and Chris Timpson's space-time state realism. A kind of a strange perspective in metaphysics these days that has that feature is Jonathan Schaffer's monism, where the universe as a whole is um, what we call the ground for all of the individual objects in the universe. Right. The the analogy with um, with state realism, if you guys are familiar with that, is supposed to be that in Wallace and Timpson's view, um, the state of the universe as a whole contains all the information about a physical system, and the the substates that go along with subsystems are all incomplete pieces of information. And they usually, the way Wallace and Timpson usually understand it, the state of the universe as a whole is fundamental. So are the states of the parts of the universe, right? Um, so in that case, we clearly have an object that's fundamental but not composite. The other sort of, the, the way that it's ambiguous what Green is actually saying here is, um, you know, he's saying a string can't be described as being composed of another substance, right? It sort of leaves open the possibility that strings could be understood as composed of other strings. Um, so you might think a way of understanding strings is that they're smaller strings all the way down. Um, you know, a string is, is, has parts, but all those parts are strings. Um, you might have to deny that strings have point size parts. And I think that's, if you're, if you're adopting a version of string theory that's realistic about strings, which I, I'm not sure is actually going to be the right picture. Um, but if you are, then that seems like a pretty defensible position. So this isn't a direct quote from Calendar except the, the parting quotes. Um, but what he says is, um, metaphysicians who think for a priori reasons that everything has to be made of uh, point-sized symbols, if they're talking about string theory, 
calendar says uh, they have to posit strange new laws in existence in, in addition to you know the physical laws of string theory they have to posit metaphysical laws perhaps uh, or or just they have to sort of add to the physical laws ones that we don't usually um, count as as laws to ensure that the simples stay together in stringy configurations right so if so if a string is built out of point size simples um, it's possible that those simples might you know that there's there's nothing ruling out the possibility that those simples might break up and the string might sort of fall apart into its point size constituents um, we're going to need laws to prevent that from happening right um, now calendar's own view is um, it's easier and sort of more natural to interpret the theory in the following way strings stay together because they have no parts and therefore uh, a string breaking up into its constituent parts is a metaphysical impossibility and we don't need physical laws to explain why that doesn't happen we don't need to complicate the physical laws that we use to describe strings um, in order to explain why they don't break apart the problem with this is that you know in real string interactions um, strings don't always stay together right there are splitting interactions so I, I do I do think more than more than in the regular paper I, I think um, uh, which is to say more than more than I do in the paper I'd, I'd like to give calendar um, uh, some credit here because I, I think he may be right that um, if you think strings are made up of point size simples then you're going to need extra laws because um, we don't what one of the things that is impossible in string theory is a string having a point size piece break off from it or having a string break up into its point size parts right um, now the right way to solve that is probably not to uh, say that strings are extended simples because they can break up into string sized parts um, I think the right way to, to fix that metaphysically and without positing physical laws is to say that strings are what we call gunky um, that they don't have point size parts all the parts of a string are, are extended um, perhaps there's no parts that have minimum extension that would that would get us the result that strings can't break up into point size parts so if I look at you know this is a sort of um, idealized interaction of the sort that my my high energy particle physics friends tell me is not really very useful in actual physical prediction but um, there are interactions in in real uh, string theory physics that are relevantly similar in that a string splits into multiple strings it's just that it usually it might, I, when I, from what I understand it involves strings usually curl back on themselves and then pinch off um, rather than just kind of breaking in the center like the one in this interaction but um, the relevant things to note about splitting interactions are well I guess the, the most relevant thing is that length is conserved in splitting interactions at least at the moment of interaction right so the lengths of the outgoing strings uh, <coughs> sum to equal the length of the incoming string um, the other thing to note which is probably the most important thing to note is that every string is capable of undergoing splitting interactions so it's not as if there are minimum length strings that once they once they break down to that length they're not going to any longer uh, break up any smaller parts right um, that I think is the most telling kind of piece of evidence that strings shouldn't count as extended simples um, if there were minimum size strings then you might think oh every string is built up out of the minimum size strings and therefore uh, you know um, the minimum size strings are the simples right but if every string is capable of splitting then it looks like 
we have to either say every string has parts or we have to tell some story about how um, new objects are kind of born every time there is a, a splitting interaction, which seems like a bit of an artificial picture to have compared with the picture where you actually have something that had parts in the first place and is breaking up into the parts. Now, here's what I think is kind of um, a more fundamental, a little bit less detail-oriented problem with the way of looking at string theory that's kind of present in both those passages from Calendar and the passages from Green. Um, the deeper problem is, well, if those, if, those, um, if those are statements about classical string theory, right, then you know they should be taken pretty seriously because it's fairly clear the ontology of classical string theory consists of strings. Um, by analogy, right, if I were talking about um, the existence of point particles in classical Newtonian mechanics, that would be perfectly legitimate. But the, the real string theory that's going to be a theory of quantum gravity uh, if it succeeds, is a quantum mechanical theory. So just like we should be skeptical of talk about point particles as applied to quantum mechanics, I think we should be skeptical of talk about strings as applied to string theory. Because when you're dealing with a quantum theory, you're going to have to solve the measurement problem. And it looks like in ordinary quantum mechanics, most you know, not certainly not all, but most of the good solutions to the measurement problem have involved um, saying no to the classical mechanical picture of what there is, right? They've involved uh, dispensing with the picture of reality as point particles and adopting a picture of reality according to which the state or some aspects of the state are what's real, right? So we've been assuming so far that quantum string theory has the same ontology as classical string theory. Um, that seems extremely unlikely. Once we've solved the measurement problem for string theory, um, its ontology may not include strings at all. So a Bohmian string theory would perhaps maybe likely be a theory of, of strings, right? You might have. Um, a state in addition to some strings um, with the state sort of like as a pilot wave for the strings you might say um, but other approaches to string theory so for example if you um, you know if you had a many worlds interpretation of string theory in kind of ordinary basic string theory you know, the, the state might be, you know, it might be, might be a theory of a sort of wave function realism about string wave functions, right? Um, now, probably what we're going to look for eventually, if we're really looking for a fundamental picture of the world, is some interpretation of M theory once that theory gets understood properly, right? Um, and, you know, it's entirely possible that M theory will be some sort of equivalent of a quantum field theory and you know we'll have something like space-time state realism that I talked about for a while ago if you uh, if, if you're a many worlds theorist you know you might think that um, what there is is a universal state with parts that correspond to maybe the parts of space-time or something um, you know similarly right if you're a collapse theorist Usually you have a, um, some description of what the wave function or the state is describing. So if we, if we are eventually adopt a collapse interpretation of string theory, then we'll have a kind of similar uh, thing going on. Point being, it doesn't look likely, given what's worked in uh, basic quantum mechanics, 
that the ontology of the quantum theory is going to be the same as the ontology of the classical theory. So here's kind of the more, um, what I would say the more interesting suggestion for what the extended simples in string theory might be. Um, perhaps string theory is going to involve quantized space and the smallest parts of quantized space will be extended simples. Um, so Brad Mitchell and Miller cite among other things uh, an interesting passage from the elegant universe um, and say, you know, the idea that's being floated, they say, in, in present day quantum gravity is that um, space or the, at least, uh, you know, at least around black holes, right, they say space is made up of two dimensional squares uh, that are sort of like one Planck length squared, right? Um, they say, um, they say, well, look, it, what does it mean to be a proper part? Um, a proper part of a region of space, that is. They say, well, um, if you're going to have a proper part of a region of space, that means that it has to occupy subregions of space occupied by the whole. But if these Planck length squares are indivisible, then uh, you can't occupy subregions of them because they don't have any subregions. So we have good reason to suppose they say that given the actual physics of space time, Planck squares have no parts, and so are extended simples. Right. Um, now, where do they get the idea that space is made up of Planck squares? Like I said, they quote a passage from Green. Interesting passage. Um, Green says, he's talking about uh, how should we explain the Bekenstein-Hawking formula for the entropy of a black hole? Right, um, which says, you know, uh, in effect, a black hole's entropy is proportional to the area of the uh, event horizon. Right. Well, Green says, um, Green says, what we need is a picture according to which there are finitely many degrees of freedom that the black hole has per unit area it has. And um, so, so he says, the first part, he notes the Bekenstein-Hawking formula. The black hole's entropy equals the number of Planck length by Planck length squares that can fit on its surface. Um, he says this, this hints toward a conclusion that every Planck length is a minimal fundamental unit of space, and each carries a minimal fundamental unit of entropy. So if we have finitely many states available, or finally many degrees of freedom, I should say, um, then it would make the most sense if those degrees of freedom were sort of uh, fit into smallest possible um, areas on the surface of the, uh, the event horizon, which would maybe go along with smallest possible lengths, so little like links, um, uh, one Planck length in size. He goes on to say, um, you know, you might think there's no problem with having a space that is sort of, you might say, like higher resolution than the number of degrees of freedom in the theory, right? A space where you could uh, potentially have more degrees of freedom than the actual physics gives you. Um, Green doesn't like this idea. He says, if we're working on a fundamental theory like string theory, it should be so tightly in tune, he says, with nature that its maximum capacity to keep track of entropy um, exactly equals the maximum disorder region can possibly contain. Sorry for the, the cutoff last line there. OK. So there's a suggestive argument here, right? Um, and I'm not going to say I gave it zero weight. But there's a question of what to make of it. Um, 
you know, there's a sort of premise here, right? Um, the premise is, in order for the kind of future final string theory to have finitely many degrees of freedom per unit area of a black hole, um, there must be minimum size units of area on the horizon of the black hole. And it's just not obvious to me that that is a necessity. Um, now, I'm sure this is a vast distortion of what's actually going on, but um, it may be that we should say, well, the degrees of freedom are proportional to the number of strings that can fit on the horizon or something like that, or you know, within the horizon. Um, and if that's, you know, if, there, if there's a finite number of strings that could fit, then we may have finitely many degrees of freedom even in an ordinarily continuous space, right? Um, in general, this requirement that a fundamental theory only have enough spatial structure to um, uh, sort of provide for the exact number of degrees of freedom that theory, the theory has is a little strange, right? We don't think we don't think it's a problem with Newtonian mechanics that you know a point particle in Newtonian mechanics moves in a space that could conceivably host vastly many more degrees of freedom than that point particle has. Um, really, I mean, what, uh, um, what I think is most relevant here is just it doesn't seem it doesn't seem like actual string theories are making or, or trying to make progress towards the ideal that Green talks about. And indeed, from what I can tell, uh, string theorists have at least the beginnings of an explanation for the Bekenstein-Hawking formula that doesn't rest on anything like the picture that, that Green is talking about. So um, when I wrote the paper, I wasn't aware of this, but uh, I have since learned that there's what they call a derivation of the Bekenstein-Hawking formula due to um, uh, Strominger and Waffe, um originally, and then there were, there were follow-up pieces for different kinds of black holes, right? The original one was for a charged black hole. Um, in five dimensions and then obviously not a very uh, realistic example of a real world black hole so they, they wanted to do other types of black holes um, but those derivations are done using ordinary string theory which is to say string theory <laughs> on a manifold right they don't um, they don't use string theory on some sort of you know discrete or otherwise space with, with minimum size spatial regions, right? Um, and they think they have a derivation of the Bekenstein-Hawking formula. So I, I'm, I'm a little puzzled by Green's suggestion that a good explanation of the formula is going to require minimum size parts of space, given that we already have uh, what what string theorists believe to be a good derivation of the Bekenstein-Hawking formula that uses ordinary string theory that we use now and ordinary existing string theories are on continuous manifolds rather than space with minimum size regions. So, you know, I think what we need to kind of soberly look at is it, in the present day development of the theory which its proponents think has accomplished a lot, including probably the accomplishment that um, that Green was just talking about. In the present day version of the theory, um, string theories exist in continuous space, right? Um, either 10 or 11 dimensional sort of, uh, um, you know, Lorentzian manifolds. And despite, you know, speculation to the contrary, which Green is engaging in there, and you, you see other things like this, like, um, um, uh, you know, um, Brad Mitchell and Miller cite this passage from um, 
uh, um, like uh, David Gross and some co-authors, uh, which is, is just opening this paper, which otherwise has nothing to do with um, minimum size space, but the, the, the paper says, the, the, the sort of opening line of the paper says, you know, we suspect that um, once we get down below the Planck scale, the notion of space itself will lose all meaning, right? Um, despite that sort of speculation, nobody's going out there and really making models of string theory that I mean, maybe not nobody, right? You never say nobody. But um, it seems like the successful models of string theory right now are ones on continuous space. Um, and this includes what people think about M-theory these days. Usually people talk about M-theory as existing on an 11-dimensional Lorentzian manifold. And if that's, if that's the truly fundamental theory that we're looking for, uh, you know, I, I sort of trust people's thoughts about what it's going to be like, and they, they seem to think it's going to exist on continuous space right now. Now, to make a sort of um, pedantic philosophical point here, too, uh, it's not as if a minimum length or a minimum volume is not compatible with an ontology of extensionless objects like points or things analogous to points, right? Um, so if I think of like a lattice, you know, just the, the sort of um, most straightforward way to think of how there could be minimum sized regions of space is that you have like a square lattice or something, right? Um, with a fixed spacing between the points. Well, there's kind of two ways to understand that metaphysically. One way is the lines or links between the nodes are fundamental objects and those have size, in which case the lattice is built up out of things that have um, non-zero size in space, so extended simples. Or else you could say the lattice is built up out of points and there is a relation of distance between the points, which is not an object, um, so that you have a, you have a, 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 a structure that has a minimum length, minimum volume, minimum size, but none of its fundamental constituents have any size. So that's sort of a neglected alternative, I think. Um, even in Brad Mitchell and Miller's literal understanding of what Green is saying there. We'll talk about that again in a sec. Um, now, the other place where we sort of commonly um, see talk about the idea of space or space-time breaking down below a certain scale <clears throat> is when we talk about non-commutative geometry, right? So, and non-commutative geometry has had some interesting applications in string theory. So what about the idea of non-commutative geometry, right? Um, could that be a way to make sense of the idea that there are minimum-sized regions of space? Well, so just to give you kind of an idea uh, in like a minute of what we're talking about here, if you're not so familiar with non-commutative geometry, um, I'm also not so familiar with non-commutative geometry. So like I said, th this paper is very much out on a limb for me. Um, so um, so the thought is, uh, you know, what, what could sort of go into a concept of quantum space-time? Well, you know, when we talk about quantum particles, we talk about non-trivial commutation relations between their properties, right? We talk about commutation relations between position and momentum, which leads to an uncertainty principle um, and sort of makes position and momentum unsharp quantities. Uh, you might think that the way to go when understanding space-time in a quantum way is to make the position variables unsharp quantities. And so uh, you can do something parallel, which is to say, you know, my coordinates, x, y, z, etc., that's going to go pretty far further into the alphabet in the case of string theory, but my 
my coordinates um, <coughs> are uh, non-commuting operators, right? Um, as a result, you have a sort of uncertainty principle uh, relating one direction in space and another direction in space. Distance, that is to say, along one direction in space and distance along another direction in space. And so the metric, like position and momentum in ordinary quantum mechanics, becomes an unsharp quantity. Um, Nick and Chris have a very good, very thorough and understandable, um, unlike anything that I'm going to do today, presentation of non-commuter geometry in, in their uh, sort of overview paper about the emergence of space-time and quantum gravity. And, um, oh, I misspelled Chris's name again. I'm so sorry, Chris. I always forget the first H in your name. And the umlaut. Well, yeah, the, the, umlaut, the umlaut I just leave out because I'm lazy. <laughs> but <laughs> uh, I know about the umlaut, but I, I always forget the first H in your name. I'm so sorry, Chris. Um, so. Uh, okay, um, so what, 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 what Chris and Nick point out is it's probably not literally correct to call a non-commutative geometry space because um, it's so far afield from our ordinary concept of spatial quantities. Um, but what it does do is behave like space at large quote-unquote distances, right? Distance I'm using to mean the length observable in the non-commutative geometry. Okay, um, so for large values of the length observable, uh, non-commutative geometry is a good approximation to space. But once you get down to small values of the length observable, uh, this uncertainty principle becomes relevant and it starts to perform quite unlike ordinary space. Um, now, in a paper that I don't understand at all, um, <laughs> but I think I can understand the conclusion, uh, uh, Martinetti and collaborators um, have shown that the length observable in non commutative geometry has a minimum value. So you might think, Oh, haha. Ha. There is a justification for um, saying that there are minimum sized regions of space. Maybe non commutative geometry is going to be the key to understanding quantum space time and string theory. And in non commutative geometry, you have a minimum value for the length, quote unquote, observable. So what you have effectively is minimum size parts of space. So as it stands now, I'm really skeptical because at least, you know, I mean, look, there, there's different things you might do with non-commutative geometry. One thing you might do is say non-commutative geometry itself is going to be something like the key to, to understanding quantum gravity. And maybe the right way to sort of proceed in thinking about theory of quantum gra gravity is to say non-commutative geometry is a fundamental picture of space-time. Um, that's not what's being done in string theory with non-commuter geometry. In string theory, rather, um, uh, work has proceeded by showing that non-commutative spaces are good approximations to certain more fundamental string theories. And then that's, that's perhaps an interesting indication that space-time behaves in a quantum way in string theory, because if a non-commuter geometry is a good approximation to it, and non-commuter geometry has sort of quantum effects in the space-time metric. Interesting, you know, we have sort of quantized space as a good approximation to string theory, right? Um, but again, maybe I shouldn't have said always, you know, you never want to like have a universal, but um, from what I've seen, non-commuter geometry is used as an approximation to more fundamental string theories. So if we're going to try to put together a picture of space, we're going to want to look at the more fundamental string theories and not at the approximation theory, right? Um, so it's not clear that in string theory anyway, non-commutative geometry is going to be relevant to the question of whether there are 
extended simples because extended simples, if they existed, would be objects in the fundamental theory. Now it is, there, there is a possibility that um, non-commutative geometry will turn out to be the fundamental theory. Um, so what if it does turn out to be fundamental? Well, again, let me make a point that I made a, a minute ago uh, about the sort of Bekenstein-Hawking example. Um, minimum length doesn't by itself entail extended simples, right? It may be that you have minimum length with an ontology of not points because, you know, it's not commutative geometry. What, what do you mean by points when, you know, the metric is sort of this smeared out object, but um, it might be that the fundamental objects are analogs of points. And in non-commutative geometry, um, at least in the Duplicator et al. version of it, um, which is supposed to rigorize it, and I believe in the Alain Kahn's version of it too, um, the objects are analogs of point, um, which are, uh, you know, what they are is you have this algebra of the, the uh, coordinate directions and um, the objects are pure states on that algebra, right? Um, which for, uh, you know, for large distances are good approximations to points in regular space, right? Um, now, the other point I'd like to make is that um, if you want to say that um, there are extended simples in non-commutative geometry, there's a bit of a strange aspect to that, which is that you're applying spatial concepts to something that, like we said, probably isn't literally what we should understand as a space. It's very far afield from our ordinary concept of space. Um, now, it may be that there are objects of minimum quote unquote length, right? Uh, minimum length observable value. Um, that's not the same thing as there being objects of minimum length. Uh, because the length observable is not length. It's, it's something that approximates length in the classical limit, right? Um, presumably, when we look at, you know, how much do we need to zoom out um, uh, from non-commutative geometry in order for it to count as uh, closely enough analogous to space that spatial concepts apply in an interesting way, uh, presumably the applicability of those concepts breaks down when we start zooming out, you know, um, it breaks down, so as if we're zooming in, right, it breaks down before we reach the minimum length. The minimum length is presumably lower than the length at which uh, non-commutative geometry stops acting as any good approximation to ordinary space. Um, of course, there's not going to be any bright line dividing the place where it stops acting like ordinary space and the place where it starts acting like ordinary space, right? With any approximation, it's going to be a sort of vague matter of fact where it starts becoming a good approximation. So you're not going to be able to really point to any place where there's a smallest size in non-commutative geometry because the concept of size stops being useful at a certain point and it's vague where that point is. You know, this is, this, is a, this is a point that I'm less sure about than some of the other ones that I made, which is saying a lot. <laughs> but um, to sort of wrap up, and again, Chris and Nick's Emergence of Spacetime paper is really great on this. It may not be literally right to say that string theory is a theory on spacetime. Um, you know, T-duality makes it a little unclear that the arena in which string theory happens is something that deserves the name space-time. Um, there's also the picture which um, uh, Nick has uh, mentioned to me as something that I was kind of leaving out of the original version of the paper. There's also the picture where, um, you know, the ontology of string theory doesn't include the background space-time and the only sort of relevant uh, spatial um, 
arena for for uh, the dynamics of the theory is the world sheet itself, right? So maybe if you have a world sheet without background picture of strings, again, it, it seems a bit weird to say that this is literally a theory on space time. Um, you know, if string theory fails to be a theory on space time, it's not clear that the concept of extended simple is going to apply to string theory. Although um, it may be that it does, this is another point that Nick made about the, uh, the draft of the paper, because perhaps, you know, um, uh, it's a fact in both duels, in the case of t-duality, that uh, strings are extended simples and what's, what's not invariant is the size of the extended simples or something, right? Um, so, but if you, if you take t -du the lesson of t-duality to be that string theory isn't literally a theory on space-time, then you might think the concept of extended simple is not one that applies to string theory. At any rate, kind of given what I understand the state of the art to be, um, I don't think we have much active evidence that uh, string theory is going to give us reason to accept the existence of extended simples in the long run. Thanks. Um, so you get, so in Geneva, you can you hear me, Chris? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, and so I think I can see everybody. You guys can raise your hands when you have questions. Um, I have questions from North Carolina. I may have a question from the Lebanon later. All right. Wow. Yeah, Josh. You know, I you probably met Josh. My student is watching you in Beirut. Yeah, right. He's, he's, he's there. Oh, hey, Josh. How's it going, man? <laughs> you can't hear him, though. Oh. <laughs> He'll text. OK, um, Kezo, I think you had that. Yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, there was one thing that you kind of started to address in the end here that I was worried about. But in the beginning, you kind of had this kind of worry uh, for the string about the classical ontology. Yeah. Uh, and then when you moved to discuss the space-time picture, then you, I think you kind of took the classical picture a little bit too seriously there to make your point. So uh, it might be that there is a similar story going on here. Uh, and and uh, that we shouldn't read them literally. And that is also, like, T-duality is one thing, but also mirror symmetry undermines kind of a straightforward uh, understanding of, of those things. And also with M-theory, you mentioned this being 11-dimensional, and sure, uh, people say that a lot, and you can uh, construct 11-dimensional models and stuff like that, but it, it's still kind of an open question what M theory is. And I mean, one good reason to say 11 dimensional is because we have that 11 dimensional supergravity. Yeah. There. But what, what M theory itself is might very well be uh, a theory that doesn't really have uh, spatial temporal concepts at, at the bottom level. We don't know yet. But yeah. that was one of the open questions that people still think about. So, I mean, in the end of it, like the two last slides, you kind of get into that and mention that, but that will kind of problematize the picture. It, of course, doesn't mean that we yeah. will end up with a picture that really supports uh, extended symbols. It might rather be that this kind of, as you also mentioned, that kind of the cutting down things might kind of lose its meaning somehow, but that was kind of just some reflection from what it No, was good. Saying. I mean, I, you know, that's, that's all an excellent point. I, M theory is such a confusing thing to, to look at because you will you'll find sources that, that say, you know, essentially exactly what you just said, right? Which yeah. is we don't know anything about what this thing's gonna be like. Yeah. And you find sources that say it's eleven you know, dimensional yeah. that, that say it's eleven dimensional and we know that, that it's it's got an ontology of two brains and five brains, right? You will you'll find that yeah. claim that we know what objects there are in M theory. I mean we don't have the like um, uh, you know, we don't have the, the Lagrangian for it or something, but, but you know. Um, so yeah, so you find very strange different, different claims about it. Um, yeah, I, so, so um, I, the way I see this is anything we say about what's going to turn out to be um, the picture of the final successful string theory or M theory 
is a huge amount of guesswork. Um, and I suppose the, the approach that I've taken is um, base the guesswork on what seems to be working now for these people. Um, and it seems like what they're working with now, you know, insofar as it makes use of spatial concepts, which is a, a kind of open question, it does so in a way that doesn't um, involve minimum size lengths, right? Uh, but, but yeah, I, I totally take the point that um, that's a very limited sort of educated yes kind of evidence. And uh, yeah, it might be that things turn out really differently. I see it, did yeah. There's a disembodied hand in, in Geneva. I think that's Chris. Yes, uh, I actually have uh, two questions, if I may, or maybe maybe one comment and a question. So the first, uh, the, the more comment is uh, the citation by Miller and Bradley Mitchell of David Gross et al. Uh, the quote where they seem to be asserting that there's, you know, there's a minimum area or a minimum length. Uh, that's probably one of the many instances you find in the physics literature where it's pretty casually just sort of asserted without much further argument from a sort of an operationalist point of view because you couldn't possibly measure anything uh, below a certain scale because you know you would have to squeeze a photon uh, to, to see it somehow squeeze the photon in such a small spatial temporal region that it would actually collapse into a black hole uh, from which it couldn't escape. So you couldn't possibly make any measurements of, of an area smaller than whatever exactly it is. Uh, and and sort of, so, so you find this uh, operationalist point quite regularly. And I, I haven't read the paper, I don't know what exactly they say, but I wouldn't be surprised if they just do the same yeah. thing. Yeah, yeah, that, that paper they actually don't even go into that, but the other paper that they cite, which is a string theory paper, is exactly kind of what you describe, a, a sort of um, showing that there's no observable length smaller than... Uh, yes, exactly. I mean, that's something that physicists do often, and from that, I, they often infer that, and therefore there is no, there is a minimum length. Um, and that inference, I've never seen an argument in the physics literature being made for that inference. Um, but yes, so I think that's probably an instance of that. And the, okay, the second, the, 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 the question I have is, I read Green a long time ago, so I don't remember precisely what he does. Um, but I, I'd be interested to hear more from you if, if, if you remember what he says in the, uh, in the point in the argument where he goes from um, the finite entropy and perhaps of, of a black hole and perhaps the interpretation of the entropy as something having to do with a finite number of degrees of freedom that are somehow located on the surface of a black hole that therefore you can sort of uh, divide the surface of a black hole into tiny little sort of areas, uh, each of which represents one of these micro degrees of freedoms uh, from which then the entropy arises. Um, so, so suppose you grant all of that, uh, that this is the correct interpretation, the correct sort of micro physical picture that we should have in mind to think of the entropy of a black hole. How, how does he support the move then, or the inference from that to the uh, conclusion that all space must be minimum sized? There must be minimum sized space or areas or something like that. Yeah, I mean, so, so the passages that I quoted are the parts that really contain the argument. Um, you know, it's a popular science book. Uh, um, I think he sees himself as trying to make clear for a general audience what the motivation is rather than kind of give a deductively valid argument for uh, his view. So 
to, to be fair to him, uh, it's kind of a tall order to, okay. to ask for like, um, you know, to ask for a knockdown argument in this kind of case. Um, um, yeah. Okay, well, I'm not, you know, the lockdown argument is maybe a tall order, but a suggestive yeah. argument. Yeah, I mean, so, um, so, so a place to look for sort of some more filling in, I think. There's actually a nice passage in uh, the Wall Black Hole Thermodynamics book um, where he goes over. Uh, what he sees as basically basically a lot of the same reasoning from Green, uh, you know, it's suggestive that um, the uh, entropy is proportional to the size of the event horizon. One way to make sense of that is that the degrees of freedom of the black hole live on the event horizon, and that's why they increase as the event horizon increases in size. Um, now, uh, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a further step. Uh, you know, it's, um, it's, it's definitely a much further step to, to go from that to saying um, that, uh, you know, this means there must be a minimum length as opposed to, to it meaning something like there's a minimum number of degrees of freedom you can pack into an event horizon of a given size for other reasons besides the existence of a minimum length, right? And um, I mean, my suspicion is that the latter is really what's happening in these existing derivations of the Bekenstein-Hawking formula, rather than anything about uh, you know minimum size regions of space. Um, you know, and as, as, as Wald points out, too, um, there, is a, there is something very weird about the, the sort of privileging of the event horizon that goes on here, given that the event horizon isn't supposed to be a physically special region locally in general relativity. Um, you know, of course, this is a common point of kind of um, conflict between people who work on general relativity and people who work on quantum gravity because with the black hole information loss thing, uh, these days a lot of people are interested in thinking about that in a way that privileges the event horizon in a special region where, for example, there's like this firewall that, you know, there's, there's this um, highly excited uh, states near the, the event horizon that burn up anything that goes through it, right? So. Um, uh, yeah, so it's, it's a little bit off the topic of what you're saying, but but um, uh, there is there is some interesting stuff about kind of related issues. So I would I would check out that passage from the Wald book. Yeah. So I take it that the reasoning is that um, since you have these scenarios where a string can split into two other strings, and it seems like the most natural thing to think is that the things that it splits into were parts of the original guy rather than two objects that just sort of came out of nowhere, as it were. Um, but it seems like maybe it's not so straightforward. Um, so if you think about like particle decay and particle physics, for example, you have some situation one sort of particle can sort of spontaneously somehow turn into uh, you know, some lighter particle plus some other byproducts, right? So, I don't know, you have an electron that can decay into, I don't know, a neutrino and a boson or something like that, right? Yeah, so it seems like this kind of process that's kind of creation, have, basically. Yeah. Right, but it seems like in some sense of you have one kind of object that sort of splits into or turns into other objects that we don't want to say are were parts of right. the original. I'm not sure how far the analogy extends. Obviously, it's different in some ways, but yeah. I think that it's some sort of process more, more like that. Where yeah, yeah. So, so right. So you're exactly right that in, in something like weak decay, mm -hmm. it's 
the, the, there's no sense in which the decay products were parts of the original uh, uh, decaying particle. Yeah, um, so I think the main problem with this analogy is, you know, so um, famously right, there's not a sort of invariant fact in string theory about when a split occurs. That's one of the, the things that, um, you know, there's, there's no sort of like point-sized vertex that you can find, unlike in particle interactions in quantum field theory. And this is one of the things that string theorists love about their theory because it gets rid of all these infinities and stuff. Um, but it means that a picture according to which two new objects are created at the, at the split is a kind of a strange picture because you, you would have no invariant notion of where do those, where, where and when do those two objects come into existence. Um, so I think actually there is a kind of concrete reason, I should go into this more in the paper, there's kind of a concrete reason why that point of view is untenable in string theory, even though it is tenable in, in you know, uh, elementary particle physics and quantum field theory. Yeah, your slide's a bit misleading because it kind of looks like that yeah. for this point it looks like there's a, right. a V there, but really it's a, right. a U. Right, exactly. Sorry, could you perhaps turn back the microphone? So there's a there's a there's something I don't understand about the argument that's I think I think, but I'm not completely sure, different from the way you responded. So this isn't say I, I don't have any problem with your response or something. And uh, 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 so I, I've been doing a lot of measuring lately because I have got a carpentry project. I'm, I don't I don't work at the plank length, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, about a, about a sixteenth of an inch. Uh, is, uh, is, uh, is by resolution. And, and so I, there's a sense in which I really can't measure anything more precisely than the, the nearest sixteenth of an inch. And just setting aside all the metaphysics, it's, it's just a bad picture of what I've done when I've made my measurement that I've now imposed a sixteenth of an inch square grid on whatever it is that I'm measuring. Because it's not that there are definite sixteenth of an inch squares all over the place. Rather, there's just uncertainty at that level and so and so when I think about simples it, it seems it suggests there's some like definite facts about what the simples are and how to get from the uncertainty you know the fact that you can't get any smaller than that to there's definite facts about which squares are where at that size it, that, that's the thing that that, that I, I was puzzled by yeah I mean um, uh, so I, I, I go more into that exact kind of thing in the written version of the paper, although I think that part of the paper is one of the parts that needs the most revision. Um, so, um, yeah, I think it would, it's really implausible, it seems, um, to suggest that what's going on in the her, the, the sort of event horizon kind of example is, you know, anything like there's a lattice on the surface of the horizon and, and you know, it's made up of, really the horizon isn't spherical, it's made up of like squares and it's sort of like a many-sided kind of uh, um, big figure. I mean, you know, ma you know, it's just because because it seems unlikely that if something like this is the picture, there's going to be a um, uh, any kind of like invariant or or non kind of like smeared out matter of fact about where the points at the vertices of the the, the lattice are, right? Um, you know, the uh, um, yeah, that's. And, and then the question is going to be, um, how can you understand minimum sized bits of area on the surface of the thing without a picture like that? And when you understand minimum sized bits of area on the, on the surface of the event horizon without 
kind of sharp um, uh, lattice points, is that going to be a picture that involves extended simples? Because because it does seem like the way that um, Brad Mitchell and Miller are understanding it is, you know, we really have a sort of grid on the surface of, of the event horizon that's really made up out of like sharp squares. And it, it seems unlikely that that's kind of the physical picture that's going to come out, just 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 at a guess, right? Um, you know, I mean, I, I gather that in loop quantum gravity, what you have is a sort of superposition of different lattices or something rather than like a single lattice by, I don't know much about that. Um, yeah, so, uh, right, so this is another place where there's a sort of open question to, to what extent is a viable picture of um, quantized size going to involve um, minimum sized objects that we can understand as being simples and, and yeah, I think that's an entirely uh, missing premise in the Brad Mitchell Miller argument. So I have a couple of questions, that one from Josh and one from Johan. Good. Um, I, I, I'm going to read Josh's from the beginning. I hope this is okay, Josh. And then I, <laughs> I sent him a little reply and then he expanded. So I'll just right. read the whole conversation, <laughs> you're, you're if that's okay. The questions. <laughs> yeah, okay. But it's kind of the question, it's sort of a question in the ballpark of the question I had as well. So, um, well, it's done in a text, so I, I might edit for um, Go ahead. typos. So, uh, he says, my question is more to the room than to Dave, but I think it is to you anyway. I'll try not to editorialize too much, I guess, um, since I think he would agree with the spirit of my question. Okay, I'm not sure what extended means if space-time comes in discrete packets of size. It seems to me that if our best physical theory tells us that the smallest physically meaningful length is the Planck scale, or the Planck length, then I'm inclined to interpret physical extension as just being lengths longer than that size. If so, then um, even if space does come in discrete Planck sizes, this would not entail that it's extended um, in any physically meaningful sense. And so I, I, I said, I think I understand kind of the question, and it's sort of along the lines of what Dave's asked, uh, uh, Dave Hilbert's asking as well. Um, I guess it's sort of similar. Um, so you know what I said is something Planck sized just would be an extended simple. That's kind of what you what, what the issue is here. Um, yeah, right. So if I can ed editorialize my question in there a bit as as well, it's how does the questions of yeah extended simple and there being a minimum length. Are they just the same question, or do they come apart? And then I'm going to read the rest of Josh's, yeah. <laughs> Josh's response. He says, and that's what I'm questioning. My intuitions are that extension might not mean the same thing in theories of space with minimum size as it does in Riemannian theories. I am suggesting that in the context of quantum theories of space-time, we cannot simply import old notions, but have to reinterpret them in light of the new ontology. When asking a question of ontology to quantum gravity, we need to translate the question into the theory, uh, the language of the theory. And so then my suggestion is that the question of extended, uh, whatever, extended simple be translated to, are there simple, okay, this, the question should be translated to, are there simples whose lengths are longer than the Planck size? Um, so it's a little bit of a different take. Um, in Riemannian context, what is extension? Um, anything longer than the minimal size. I think I read that wrong. I mean, I didn't put the right intonation in. Um, and so I'll read it, I'll do it again. In Riemannian context, what is extension? Anything longer than the minimal size. In the non-Riemannian context, what is extension? Anything longer than the minimum size, which might just happen to be the Planck size. So there's sort of several things in there. But yeah, that's good. Um, yeah, I, I think I'll take the last first because that's really interesting. Um, Right, I, th there's a question here about um, what, um, what the connections are between the concepts we're using in this discussion and concepts that have been used in the discussion in the past. And 
I think given that we're going to be working with um, pictures of reality that were sort of undreamt of when the idea of, you know, extended objects and proper parts was brought into metaphysics is, yeah, it's a sign that we may need kind of run into situations where the translation between uh, the metaphysics dictionary and the physics dictionary is indeterminate or or there, there's kind of like um, the tough question is how to translate um, and yeah this may be one of those points I mean you think about what's the sort of examples of extended simples that um, got people started talking about this it was something like Descartes atoms where they were you know they're big you know I mean big you know like they you had a you had a plenum that was made up of bits of stuff that were sort of indivisible beyond a certain point but they still you know um, uh, like you say right had size bigger than the smallest possible size or bigger than the smallest kind of imaginable size um, or the, the smallest well-defined size might be might be a better way to put it right um, yeah uh, so um, so let's see um, so let, let me turn back to what they say right um, right um, yeah so so Brad Mitchell and Miller are focusing here on the the concept of what it is to be a proper part and arguing that minimum sized regions don't have proper parts um, they don't focus on the concept of extension and whether uh, minimum sized regions should count as extended. I think they, I think they think it's definitional of extension that, um, you know, if you have a length, area, or volume greater than zero, you're extended. Um, yeah, I mean. This is this is a this is a great question about the sort of translation between the the physics and metaphysics dictionaries here. Um, I think in some ways, right, uh, the right way to answer it is to say, well, you know, um, uh, we can decide to use our word extended simple one way or the other. Um, it's an interesting question whether there are non-composite objects that have non-zero size. And it's also an interesting question whether there are non-composite objects that have size bigger than the minimum well-defined size. Um, extended simples in the latter sense that have a size bigger than the, the minimum well-defined size um, those would exist if we took the sort of argument that says that strings are simples seriously, right? Um, you know, in, in an ordinary string theory in, in like a manifold. Um, now, uh, simples that are extended in the sense of having non-zero size, but not extended in the sense of having more than the minimum size. Um, it's a little less of a contentful notion, but at the same time, there are a lot of people writing metaphysics papers who think there can't be any such things. So in that sense, showing that there is an extended sample by, by Brad Mitchell and Miller's definition um, is still a sort of... Uh, like an achievement, you know, because people have argued that there can't be any such things, right? Um, I mean, you know, and I, I, I think that's silly to say that there can't be any such things, right? I, I think maybe, maybe one of the ways of um, 
best understanding what's um, you know going on in this argument is one side of the argument is at least proving that we can understand what we mean when we say that there are such things and that, that there's no reason it should be impossible that there be such things um, what I was most interested in this paper is do we have reasons to suppose that our world is, is made up partly out of such symbols and I think I think there's not much reason to think that right now but yeah um, uh, yeah uh, oh and, and to, to Nick's question about what's the, the kind of connection between extended between extended simples and minimum size I mean um, I think that it sort of boils down to this question I was talking about about whether whether a minimum size theory is going to involve uh, points as the fundamentals or whether it's going to involve sort of like segments as the fundamental objects you know if, if the fundamental objects are points with a primitive distance relation between them then those aren't extended simples but if the fundamental objects are segments and the points are the, the places where the segments join then that is extended symbols and then you know of course in any kind of like realistic theory like this we're not talking about points we're probably not talking about segments we're talking about what are the sort of analogs of points and segments we know what that means in the in the non-commutative geometry case at least mathematically we know what it means right but um, for any kind of candidate theory we'd have to have to look at again how to translate those concepts into the new physics language um, okay I'm gonna read the question from Johan um, maybe a little terse so if he wants to elaborate in a minute I can do it. but um, so how is the debate between so calendar and uh, green and your gunk hypothesis um, so it's about that bit at the beginning how does it translate or survive once we start to think about s duality or t duality does everything go through the same I guess you maybe you didn't that specific point but t duality came out. yeah exactly uh, hi on thanks for, for watching um, do you want to say a couple of words about what teach about the oh yeah, yeah sorry I should yeah yeah right so so this is something that that Nick has sort of uh, um, uh, focused on a lot. T duality being um, so so a duality, right, is a is a relation that string theorists tend to interpret as a physical equivalence between uh, different theories. Um, it's a transformation. Uh, from one theory to another that leaves the sort of like energy level structure uh, unchanged um, and expectation values observables right um, if you if you redefine the observables from the one theory into observables from the other and, and this duality is between um, uh, string theories that um, have uh, you know, so so in string theories, right? There are the there are the sort of full size dimensions, and there are the compact dimensions, which um, have a sort of maximum length along them because they're they're curled around um, in a circle. Uh, they they have a, a radius, right? A characteristic radius. Um, and T duality holds between string theories with characteristic radius R and characteristic radius one over r so so there's supposed to be a duality between string theories that have a very tiny characteristic radius and ones that have a very large characteristic radius um, so that there the, the way the physicists will often interpret this is there's no fact of the matter about whether the uh, um, the characteristic radius of the extra dimensions is r very small or one over r very large yeah um now so um so i was suggesting right that maybe a way to understand at least classical strings is as gunky objects that have strings as their parts but no point size parts um 
And now, um, Yeah. Do you, so I'm imagining yeah. a string kind of now wrapped around the compact dimension. Yeah. It seems that the yeah. sort of, I mean, pig divided up into parts anyway, that's going to survive the, the T duality. That's what I was thinking was that, um, so, so, so if, if the parts are point size, of course, right, it would because, you know, what, what, what T duality is doing is changing the relations of distance between the point size parts. Um, what, T duality would be doing in the case of gunky parts with size, I guess, is changing the, you know, the size of those gunky parts, right? I mean, uh, you know, uh, this is complicated a bit by the, the conformal variance, right? You might think because, um, like, I don't know, you, one could maybe make a case that there's not really a kind of useful concept of the size of a part of the string. You know, given the conformal symmetry, but what were you going to say? But it still has the, I mean, you've got the um, sort of induced metric notion, right? So, yeah. I mean, there is a radius associated with these. So there is a circumference. And right. So if you've divided it into 10 parts, it's going to be a tenth of the. Yeah, yeah. It's going to be a tenth of the circumference. Yeah, I mean, is it. Do you feel like it's compatible with the, uh, the conformal symmetry that you say, like, that it's possible to say I'm dividing this string into 10 equal sized or equal length parts? Like, is that is that an invariant notion? So, I mean, what goes with what the continuous background that you referred to a few times is, I mean, that there has yeah, to be yeah. some metric. Right, right. So it's with respect to that. Right, so use with respect to the back. Good, good, of course. OK, rather than with respect to any metric on the, on the, the string itself. Good, OK, yeah. Yeah, so, uh, so I think that's my answer. Um, Changing, changing the metric is not going to change the sort of part whole relations, right? So I think it'll, I think it'll, uh, I think it'll be fine. And now I expect uh, Kazo to say that if you the S duality where you change the topology, it's uh, oh, no, no, that's mirror. mirror. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's going to be more mm, complicated. I see. Okay. And so and also with the T duality case, I, I kind of think if if one takes the, the physicist view seriously there, which I actually think one should do, but I will not argue for here, mm. uh, then those different radii are kind of more of an artifact of the mathematical representation rather than something real. And what's kind of the real effective space time must be something that is kind of shared by both descriptions. And that might kind of change the whole picture a little bit instead of that. That's kind of also a thing where we're kind of going back to my original question where I said that you take the uh, the classical prima facie picture on the space side more seriously yeah. than you, you did on the on, on the on the entities. But this is interesting. So so let me try and learn something. Uh, let me try and learn something for a moment. Um, do you think that the likely outcome is going to be something like um, you know? we'll end up with a theory where we sort of treat these dualities like symmetries and eventually we kind of quotient them out and we end up with a theory that, that only includes the invariant content that is agreed on by all the all the dual theories? Is yes, that, yeah, that, right. that, that is what I, I kind of hope that kind of a deeper understanding, yeah. maybe an M-theory version of that yeah. would be such that uh, all dual pictures just correspond to one single solution right. of that. Right. And then kind of for practical purposes, we need these dual things to kind of explore the theory right now. And But one should be kind of very wary of taking the prima facie picture right. of one or the other too seriously right. at this stage. So that's kind of how I think about it. That's cool.